From Wish TV, this is a News 8 Town Hall, Vaccine Central, presented by Community Health Network. The way we're looking at it now, it's almost a race between getting people vaccinating and this surge that seems to want to increase. After a year of loss, signs of hope in the form of vaccinations. More shots in the arm will get us back in business quicker than anything else. So let's finish the job, Indy. Get your shot. Mass COVID-19 vaccination clinics held across the state. What this represents about everyone coming together and making sure what we're doing is truly by definition, equitable. Including the famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's just really been neat to see an entire community, not just the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but an entire community of Hoosiers come together to help our fellow Hoosiers out. More than a million Hoosiers now considered fully vaccinated. We are near the end of the race. We can see the finish line, but we have not yet crossed it. Now is the time to dig deep and sprint to the finish. As Indiana and the entire country race to beat the virus. We have no time to waste. If we act now, decisively, quickly, and boldly, we can finally get ahead of this virus. And good evening. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of News 8 Vaccine Central. I'm Brooke Martin. And I'm Phil Sanchez. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's been more than a year since the pandemic started. More than 700,000 Hoosiers have contracted the virus. Nearly 13,000 unfortunately have died across the country. That number more than half a million. Yeah, but there is hope. Three vaccines now available. And as we approach May, everyone 16 and older is now eligible for the vaccine. Already one third of those eligible are fully vaccinated or more than 1.8 million Hoosiers. Another half million have received the first dose. But not everyone is taking advantage of the free shot. Some are still hesitant. News 8's David Williams explores the reasons why. On a regular afternoon inside this barber shop, people talk about life and what's going on in the community. And the topic of the COVID-19 vaccine comes up. And 3S Campbell knows how he feels, and he is not shy about telling us. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I've heard, like, the, um, the situation where when you do take the shot, you get sick or you catch a blood clot. That unease is very real within some people in central Indiana. That hesitancy has historic roots. It's known as the Tuskegee study. Back in 1932, according to the CDC, the U.S. Public Health Service ran a study of the untreated effects of syphilis in black men in Tuskegee, Alabama. They ran the study on more than 300 people without notifying the participants about their disease. Researchers told the men they were being treated for bad blood, but they really did not receive the proper treatment to cure their illness. Shandy Durth points to a recent Kaiser Foundation report on vaccine hesitancy. And a lot of um, blacks and African Americans said they are hesitant to get the vaccine. They want to take that wait and see approach, basically. And even though the mortality rates are so much higher among Blacks and Hispanics, um, there's definitely a hesitancy there, there just because of the past in the U.S. Gregory Kenny owns Kenny's Academy of Barbering. Two of his brothers died from COVID a month apart from each other. If a disease can start in Wuhan, China, and then affect my brother in Indianapolis, Indiana, then we are all connected. Alicia Jessup and her outreach teams count on community connections to reach as many people as possible about the vaccines. The community health workers, what they have said, you know, a lot of patients are still uneasy about them, but they'll then tell them, you know, I received the vaccine. They like to hear their personal, you know, personal stories of some of the clinical staff if they received it. And sometimes that makes them feel better. And they, then they're going able to, uh, they actually go on to schedule their appointment. In an effort to combat vaccine hesitancy, there is help with registering for the COVID-19 vaccine. Happening right now, the Marion County Public Health Department has set up a help desk at the John Boehner uh, Neighborhood Center on East 10th Street from now until 8 p.m. It is in the second floor training room and computer lab. You can sign up for a vaccine appointment, ask questions about the vaccine, get Spanish, uh, Spanish language help and other information. Marion County Health Department Dr. Uh, Virginia Kane was there this morning answering some questions. Uh, Dr. Kane is joining us now as well as Dr. Tamika Jones with Community Health Network to discuss the vaccine and questions that you may still have. And Dr. King, I want to start with you tonight. Uh, we just saw that you took part in that vaccine registration event. Tell us about it and what you saw and heard from people there. 
So um, let me just say that one of the concerns we've had from um, some of the communities where it's hard to reach from an access standpoint, uh, people appreciate going to a site where they've already used those resources, they trust the people uh, in those uh, clinics, and they have a better understanding of what their needs are. And so it's just an incredible opportunity where we're bringing the resources uh, to where the people reside versus we sometimes require people to come to us, healthcare systems, in order to receive their services. Dr. Kane, where do we stand with vaccinations right now? Are we where we should be, in your opinion? So definitely we're not there where we need to be. And, you know, a major limiting step for us was initially not having enough vaccines in order to uh, distribute it into the community. And then we had the second barrier uh, from a health equity standpoint, being able to distribute it uh, to different racial and ethnic populations from an ep equitable standpoint. So we're, we're behind, but we are making some uh, necessary gains uh, based on different age groups. For example, if you were over the age of 65, believe it or not, the highest racial and ethnic population with the highest vaccination rates are our Latinx population over the age of 65. But as you get younger, uh, that health disparity gap really increases so that if I was between 25 and 44 years of age, uh, the vaccination rate for whites is like over 31%, but African-Americans or blacks are about one third of the vaccination rate compared to their white counterparts. Uh, the Latino X population in that young age group is about 50% of the vaccination rate compared to their white counterparts, with the Asians being at the second highest rate of vaccination from a racial and ethnic standpoint. So the gap widens as you get older. So, so Dr. Kane, we'll stay with you for a moment. We thank you for your time. How do you convince or assure those who are maybe uncertain about getting the, the, the shot? Well, I think that one of the things that I think has speeded up people's concerns about the vaccines is that we're now seeing these variant mutated strains that are now in our country and almost have been identified in almost every state. They're way more contagious and that they may be associated with more severe complications. So you don't want to wait and be struck with a virulent mutant strain. It increases your risk for hospitalization and also your ability to maybe be in a critical care unit um, intubated on a respirator. So, hey, if you don't protect yourself, think about your loved ones because you can spread this infection just by talking to someone those minute invisible respiratory droplets just by my talking gets into the air and it remains in the air for hours. So all I have to do is have someone come in that space after I leave and inhale for them to contract the infection. So think about your loved ones, think about your colleagues and people that you respect and love. Dr. Jones, I wanna bring you in. How do you talk to patients who are hesitant about the vaccine? Uh, so my approach is to tell them my experience. Um, I let them know that I've had the vaccine. I'm very transparent with any side effects that I experience. Um, I'm transparent also about my initial hesitancy with the vaccine and wanting to learn more about it, gain more information. Um, so I did my own research and read up on it. And the CDC website is excellent. There's a lot of very simple, easy to read and understand information there. Um, so I always start there and direct patients there. Um, but if they ask me any questions about my experience with the vaccine, what I ask my mom or my husband to get the vaccine, I'm very open and honest about that. Well, we've heard some people who have taken the first dose, but maybe are skipping the second dose. Dr. Lindsay Weaver, Chief Medical Officer for the State Department of Health, offered this advice. 
people who are hesitant to get their, their second dose, I get it. Uh, we do see more side effects after you get that second dose. I My advice and what I've told my fr um, friends and family is just plan for it. Plan to not feel so great that next day. Make it a day where you just hang out on the couch and watch movies, take some ibuprofen, uh, drink lots of fluid, and then you're done. Um, ultimately, it is way better than having COVID. It is way better than being hospitalized. Um, and it's worth it because you know when you have that those small reactions, that, that means that the vaccine is working. So my advice is to just just do it. It gets you to that 95% effective rate. Um, that That's really what gets you to that high number. And what we've seen here in Indiana and nationally is that it's even higher than that um, of preventing you from getting COVID. Okay, so our Wish TV team has obtained data on side effects for Hoosiers who have received COVID-19 vaccines. We found no cases of severe blood clots in Indiana, but we did find more than 15,000 reports of other side effects. So we've got the information from the vaccine uh, adverse events reporting system run by the CDC. The top five side effects, you're looking at them on your screen right now. Headaches, chills, fever, pain, and fatigue. As you can see, the most reported headache by nearly 40% of the people who reported side effects. The others are all in the 30% range. So Dr. Kane and Dr. Jones, is this similar to what you've been seeing and hearing? Yes, yes, that's very similar to my own personal experience. Um, the first vaccine had some arm soreness, was very fatigued. Um, and then within 24 hours, I was fine. Um, my second dose, I had every side effect except for fever that was on the list. Um, but I did find, you know, I just rested, um, increased my fluids, took some Tylenol for my headache. Um, I was able to still go to work, but I have had colleagues and as well as patients who um, felt like their headache was significant enough or some of their other symptoms were significant enough that they wanted to stay home and rest. Um, so it was very similar to what you just presented. So mine was just simply a sore armness in my arm, okay, and so uh, I took a little Tylenol within 30 minutes. The soreness uh, didn't seem to bother me or, or what have you. But I try to tell people, if you get a headache, take your Tylenol, ibuprofen, or take it early. Don't wait until like, you know, someone, they talk about if you have a migraine headache and you wait till it gets so bad and then you take your medication, it doesn't work as well. Correct. So if you got the fevers or the chills or the muscle aches, you know, take the Tylenol early and definitely don't do vigorous exercise yes. the day before you get in the vaccine, the day of you get in the vaccine, and maybe even the day after. So uh, rest, I'm prescribing rests for you, uh, just so you know. Yeah. So another possible reason for the hesitancy, uh, the pause in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I recently had a chance to talk about that with U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy. Look. Well, look, I certainly after the news of the pause came out, I absolutely understand that for some people, they may have heard that and it may have been unsettling and they may have been worried and may have increased some of their concerns. And, and I get that. that. That's understandable. But that's why it's so important for us to, to get out there and to, to be open and transparent with people about why this pause happened and what the facts are. And very importantly, to complete the investigation uh, as soon as we can. And I anticipate that uh, within days that we will have, uh, more information about the CDC and FDA's investigation into this matter. Uh, and, you know, we'll see what it sh shows us. But what I can uh, tell you for sure is whatever recommendations come out will be the result of a very thoughtful, thorough analysis. We'll be transparent uh, about what was found. And we'll make sure, again, regardless of what happened to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that people have safe vaccines for them. And they already have that today in the Pfizer and Moderna options. Right. So, so what is the what is the White House uh, and this administration specifically doing to make sure that underserved communities are are able to uh, have access to the vaccinations more so than maybe ever before? Yeah, that is so important because again, we've got to get everyone vaccinated, and that means everyone needs to have a fair shot at getting uh, you know access to this vaccine. That's why success uh, it feels not just determined by how many people we get vaccinated, but how fairly and how quickly uh, we do this. Uh, there are several steps the administration has taken to improve access, especially to underserved communities. One is to set up uh, community vaccination centers in underserved areas. Second, set up mobile units that are actually going to hard to reach areas. A third, by getting these vaccines into pharmacies, now nearly 40,000 pharmacies across the country, as of today, 90% of Americans will live within five miles uh, of a pharmacy or an institution that has the vaccine. And the other place that we've been really investing in are community health centers. 
getting vaccine directly from the federal supply to those community health centers so that they can get vaccine to the populations they serve, which tend to be historically, again, underserved populations. So we've got to do this equitably. We've got to make sure that the distribution is reaching everyone. Because the bottom line is COVID doesn't care where you live. It doesn't care what your skin color is or how much money you make. Uh, this vaccine, this virus can affect any one of us, which means right. that we've got to double down on getting, it to, getting the vaccine itself to everyone to protect them. Dr. Fauci came out over the weekend and said uh, that people, even after being vaccinated, will still have to wear a mask. Do you agree? Well, it depends when you're when you're talking about right now, because we still uh, need to vaccinate fully the majority uh, of people in America. Uh, the masks are there uh, to help uh, one just to, to recognize that we do have you know a small number of people who won't respond to the vaccine, and we want to make sure that if there is even a small chance of asymptomatic transmission, that people who are not vaccinated don't get exposed to the virus. But here's what you're already starting to see. Uh, the more people get vaccinated, the more we can start to loosen those restrictions. The CDC already said now people who are vaccinated can get together with other vaccinated people without a mask. That's a huge step forward. And we'll continue to take steps like that forward the more we get vaccinated and ultimately when rates of infection come down in our country. So I want to talk about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I personally was scheduled to get it yep. right before uh, it was recalled or, or paused temporarily. Uh, I think a lot of people are caught, uh, maybe having a bit of hesitation after this was um, paused. So I want to talk about this. Dr. Jones, let's start with you. Have you seen it cause a setback? Should people be concerned? Uh, in my own personal practice, I have had patients that were uh, on the fence and then considered, well, if I'm going to get a vaccine, I'll just get the single dose. And then this happened. And so then that caused a little bit more concern um, with those patients. Um, but just again, educating them on the other options um, and then also letting them know that it was a very small subset of patients who experienced that side effect um, or had any type of adverse event uh, related to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, and maintaining transparency. But I will say that it did cause some hesitancy uh, with patients that I've seen, um, but I've just tried to reassure them and then educate them about the other um, options that they do have. Dr. Kane, uh, what has your experience been with the J&J &J vaccine? And can you explain the main difference, which I believe is how the vaccines are manufactured? So first of all, let me just say I'm, I'm a, I'm a one-shot kind of girl, so <laughs> I took the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and um, I'm, I'm a little uh, uh, nervous around needles. I never have a problem giving someone a shot, but I'm just not crazy about getting one. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, But today, actually, uh, in an interview on a radio show and just having people call in, I had a number of participants say that uh, they had had vaccine hesitancy, but a number of them said that they're going to get the Johnson & Johnson because if I just have to get a shot, I'm just going to get one and, and be done with it. So, you know, always when you have a pause uh, from the Food Drug Administration and concerns about uh, these six cases of women that experience uh, this rare disorder of blood clots uh, in within a two-week period, it, it highlights how very sophisticated and what a great safe monitoring system that we have that out of over 7 million people, we were able to identify these six cases that quickly and that rapidly, resulting in one rare case per 1 million of people. Uh, so I think it's done an incredible job. I think it does require concern for people who are concerned about vaccines, but you have a number of them who are just saying, hey, this has really been looked at very closely with the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So we feel very uh, comfortable about the recommendations from the experts coming across the country. I should also um, disclose to you that I'm a member of the National Medical Association's uh, COVID-19 Task Force. And I'm the uh, chair of the Infectious Disease Section for the National Medical Association, which is the oldest and largest physician group. And we have very extensively been looking at the data, clinical data, that even before the vaccines were approved, to make sure that there was enough racial and ethnic minority participation in these clinical trials to make sure that they were safe. We've looked at the technology, which I'll talk about real quickly, um, uh, to just make sure 
we weren't seeing major adverse um, uh, events that unnecessarily should be appearing. So it's been scrutinized by a number of also medical associations, medical groups from a sound medicine standpoint as well. Okay, panel sit tight, we'll be right back. In science, and science is not a contradiction of faith. Um, but God uses science to help people to live out their faith. Still ahead, the role religious leaders are playing in encouraging or discouraging people from getting the vaccine. You're watching Wish TV, Indiana's only statewide TV news network. From Wish TV, this is a News 8 Town Hall. Vaccine Central, presented by Community Health Network. Well, the pandemic has gone on for more than a year now, and that's likely taking a toll on your mental health. Joining our panel today is Kimball Richardson, mental health counselor at Community Health Network. So, Kimball, uh, we want to start with you this round. What are you seeing in patients right now? A lot of intensity in whatever feeling they're having. Uh, a lot of people are electing thankfully, to take care of their emotional health, mental health, uh, and they're seeing it as part of overall good health. So physical health, mental health, spiritual health, all together makes for uh, important components. But we are seeing statistics of rising depression and even suicide rates through this. Um, are you seeing any of that? In, are you seeing increased rates of that here locally? Yes, we are, and uh, in fact, um, we have seen in the history of having a behavioral health service line at Community Health Network the most demand for our services ever mm. since the late wow. 60s, early 70s. So it's been intense. Thankfully, people are reaching out. We do appreciate that. And uh, we want to try to get people the help that they need for sure. Well, let's talk more about that, Kimball, if you don't mind. What do you tell patients who are maybe dealing with the stress and, and what seems like a lot of anger because of the pandemic? First, I like to just acknowledge that the pandemic was such an emotional shock to us as well. It was so intense and so dramatic. And not only did we have to stop and change our behavior almost overnight, literally, but it was because we could die if we didn't. That is so traumatic for so many people. And that happened for so many months that that level of intensity can cause some acute or short-term and longer-term problems. So we want people to understand, we understand that there was a shock at first, then some of the other emotions can kick in like depression and anxiety. Dr. Jones, I'm sure that as well as medical uh, expertise, you're also having to offer um, some mental and behavioral um, advice as well. Can you talk about the difference for people who may have been sick or even lost a loved one compared with those who haven't? How are they dealing with this pandemic? How are you seeing the difference there? I think the main difference that I've seen in my patients are those who have not had a direct uh, friend or family member, loved one affected by COVID seems they seem to have fared far um, more better than much better excuse me than my patients who know someone who has passed away or know someone who was in the ICU on the ventilator um, the way that they um, take precautions when they go out in public the way they interact with their social circle has been totally different so those who have had a direct effect from COVID um, they're extra precautious they're you know, staying in it, adhering strictly to the social distancing guidelines. Um, those who have not, they come in and say, I don't really know anyone who's been affected by COVID. So I don't really think it's a big deal. I don't go anywhere. So they're a little less likely to adhere to the guidelines. Um, emotionally, my patients who have had um, direct effect from COVID, whether that's multiple family members dying or they've been, they've lost a, a husband and now they're on a single income, um, depression has definitely either been exacerbated or it has definitely increased. 
Um, I have a lot of teens who are not used to being shut in um, and not having any social interaction. So I have a lot of adolescent patients who are coming in and they are suicidal um, and it's, it's, it's scary. So one place people often go for healing is church. But as News 8's Alexis Rogers reports, even church leaders have differing opinions on the vaccine. Religious influence. Do not put the vaccine. No reciba la vacuna. Believe in the blood of Jesus. Has been a major determining factor of the efficacy of combating the coronavirus. God, God put in science. And science is not a contradiction of faith. Um, but God uses science to help people to live out their faith. Groups that people are a part of, um, where they draw their identity and, and, and how they think of themselves and in their worlds uh, is key to how they were interpreting the pandemic, the threat, um, or whether it's you know not a big deal, um, but also the behaviors that they should or shouldn't take. Andrew Whitehead, associate professor of sociology at IUPUI, says Christian nationalism is at the root of the distrust of things like the COVID-19 vaccine and pandemic protocols. Christian nationalism, which is this desire to see their brand of Christianity privileged in the public sphere. So basically the key organizing force to how society should operate. Um, so those that embrace it, they've tended to downplay the threat of the virus, um, the behaviors or precautions we should take, um, and they tend to be more skeptical of the vaccine. This anti-vaccine, this anti-government, and I'm proud to be anti-government. At Life Tabernacle Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Pastor Tony Smell preaches his message. Hallelujah, Jesus. He's made a name protesting COVID-19 rules. The line is in this vaccine, number one, the virus has been a scam from the beginning. It's always been politically motivated for mail-in ballots and voter ID. That's what has got a new administration in the White House today. En las, en la vacunas. In the vaccines. Están hechas para alterar su ADN. They are made to alter your DNA. Guillermo Maldonado is the pastor at King's Jesus International Ministry in Miami. His church has been labeled a highly influential political ground zero when it comes to pushback on coronavirus protocols and the vaccine. A quarter of the population or so um, are, are white evangelicals. And so if the vaccine uptake in that group is really low, it really makes it almost impossible for us to reach the 70 or 80 percent that some scientists suggest to, to uh, reach herd immunity. It's interesting when we have this conversation because Christianity is so diverse. And when we start to talk about the distrust that might be happening within the white evangelical group, we're seeing a different distrust within the African-American Christian population, which is vast as well. Talk to me a little bit about the difference between those distrusts. I think within the white uh, evangelical community where we see um, a white Christian nationalism is a really powerful influence there. Again, it's this distrust towards authority figures that they see um, are outside their community or might have a different view of what America should look like. Um, I think for Black Americans, there has been a really horrendous history in how they've been treated by medical institutions and science and scientists. And so there is a deep distrust and a rightful distrust towards scientific community because of, of those horrors of the past. And so while we may see skepticism in both, there are very different um, tributaries through which that skepticism comes and flows through because they've had vastly different experiences. White Christians have not experienced um, some of that, um, you know, that treatment at the hands of the medical community that black Americans have. Leaders like Pastor Jeffrey Johnson, senior pastor of Eastern Star Church here in Indianapolis, believes it's the church's responsibility to provide the community with as many resources as possible, which is why they've hosted mass vaccination clinics for the city. I would say it's to get the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Don't get caught up in conspiracy theories. Don't get caught up in lies. Lies come to destroy, truth comes to develop, and don't get caught up in all this disinformation and misinformation. Find out the truth from the health professionals or from your primary health professional, your, doc, your own doctor, and then take that truth, apply it to your life, and get that 
healing and uh, that you that you're going to need. All right, Dr. Kane, I know you probably want to comment on this one. What do you say to those religious leaders who are maybe against vaccinations? I think we have to look at do we want to go back to like in the 1930s or 1940s? We've made so tremendous accomplishments, whether it's cancer treatment, people are living. Um, and so do we want to go back to the dark ages? And so I think that we have to have the expertise, let the experts who know about the science, who've done the education for years, who reviews the research, help to make those decision makers as opposed to someone who may not have the background, may not have the knowledge about ma making recommendations, that can be life-threatening for others. So if you have an opportunity that you have an infection in your, in your brain, like meningitis, and I can treat it and you live, would you not recommend that treatment? And so this is no different. But I have to say, what do you say to the family members of someone whose a loved one has died. And so how do you say that they died um, and this was just a hoax or this was not real? And so I have to believe that there are members with these religious leaders that are from a health professional background that I hope will look at the sound medicine, look at the science, Look at public health approaches that we have made. Do you know we've gained 30 years of life just from two things, immunizations and the safety of the water we drink. And it's been clear that our life ex expectancy has increased by 30 years, just the result of those two things. So um, don't be heartbroken. Uh, I know of some ministers from my home state who had initially felt the same as some of the religious leaders that you showed on this case, but became infected, infected some of their associate pastors, leading to one of the pastor's wives dying. And they now regret what they said. And, and they did it with all good intentions, and they honestly believed what they believed, but that information was incorrect. So please, we don't need to lose any more lives. Um, you know, I wear a seatbelt for a reason. So if I'm in an accident and for whatever reason I roll over in that car, I know that can save my life. So I wear that seatbelt. So there are a lot of examples where the science, the medicine, has made huge dividends in improving the life and safety of our residents in the United States, please take advantage of those uh, amazing, amazing accomplishments that we've had through the years. Kimball, I think part of the stress of this pandemic for uh, a lot of us has been the controversy surrounding it. What do you say about the constant presence of bickering on social media, anti-vaxxers, COVID deniers? How, how do we <clears throat> handle that? Because it's just a barrage of, uh, this opinion, that opinion, and in infighting. Well, I think it's easy to just say, cut it out. Come on, what the heck? <laughs> uh, but fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what we can't see, causes people to hunker down. I'll say that, hunker down, get into their own camps, not have an open mind and heart to information or to potentially understand what someone else might be going through. You know, as mental health professionals, we are taught to sometimes look under the surface or scratch the surface and let's take a peek at what's going on in there. So if someone is really angry and, um, you know, really putting their opinion out there and, and it seems inflexible, Oftentimes, there's fear behind that. And when you can come at a person with some grace, open arms, love, understanding, uh, it makes for better conversation. Good advice. Well, up next, we're going to look ahead to the summer.
travel and upcoming big events, including the Indy 500. Hear my interview with Speedway President Doug Bowles and the safety precautions being taken to keep fans safe. You're watching Wish TV, Indiana's only statewide TV news network. From Wish TV, this is a News 8 Town Hall, Vaccine Central, presented by Community Health Network. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mary Gillis. I've been reporting on COVID-19 for more than a year, both here on television and on wishtv.com. After Merck's failed attempt at a coronavirus vaccine, scientists at the biopharmaceutical company have turned their efforts towards development of a new experimental drug, which they say stops COVID-19 in its tracks. It's called monlupiravir. The medication is said to be successful in stalling the virus's ability to replicate itself for those infected. The coronavirus vaccine is making it difficult for doctors to detect breast cancer because some women are developing swollen lymph nodes around the tissue. Doctors say it is not a cause for concern. However, you're going to want to do something specific before you schedule your next mammogram. From pandemic to epidemic, why one doctor says the coronavirus is here to stay and booster shots will most likely be in our future sooner than we think. This is not only because of the new variants that continue to surface, but because viral diseases are very difficult to eradicate. We've made it easy for you to find these and all of my COVID-19 stories. Just grab your phone or laptop and go to wishtv.com and look for the medical section in the news tab. Dr. Mary Gillis, Wish TV, wishtv.com, and follow us on Facebook. Mary, thank you. The Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra is returning to the stage in front of a live audience. The four-week series begins May 13th at the Hilbert Circle Theater. It will feature both classical and pop performances. Tickets will be limited due to the ongoing pandemic. Face masks will be required. For more information on showtimes and ticket sales, head to the symphony's website. And that being said, as more people get vaccinated, more places are opening up. Yeah, the return of the symphony is just one of them. And there's a much bigger event happening at the end of the month. Yes, of course, the Indy 500. Earlier today, I talked with Speedway President Doug Bowles. Okay, Doug, so tell us what can fans expect this year at the Indy 500? Certainly going to be different than they've experienced in the past, but it's going to be a lot better than last year when we couldn't have anybody. So I think the biggest thing for people to be prepared to do, we're going to make those masks required. So we want people to wear those from the moment they walk in until they leave, except when they're eating or drinking. So that's going to be really important. Only 135,000 people here, so not 300,000 plus. So it'll definitely look different. Be a little bit of space between your customer groups side to side, but you may have somebody in front of you and behind you. So those are the biggest things. And then just the stuff we've gotten used to over the last year, just try and keep your distance, uh, especially standing in concession stand lines. And we're gonna do a temperature check when you come in, but hopefully uh, people will be able to just kind of look through all those and get past it. And we'll enjoy uh, an Indy 500 like we're used to seeing on the track. What about access? Will fans still be able to go onto the track and in the garage area? So, you know, especially around a GMR Grand Prix, one of the things we've always looked forward to is that the checker flag of that race is allowing people to come down onto the grid. We're not going to do that this year. There's nobody in the infield on the mounds. You can go on the infield in, this, in the grandstands and in the plaza area, but not on the mounds. So that access is not here this year. No concerts, those kind of things. And then a handful of the folks that have a silver badge or bronze badge, which is our credential, they can have access to the garage area as long as they're vaccinated. And we're doing that because the IndyCar series is trying to protect their teams and their, and their drivers so that nobody gets COVID and gets knocked out of running the Indianapolis 500. So we're trying to keep that as close to a bubble as we can for those teams to make sure they make it to May 30th. Certainly understandable. How, how do you plan to enforce the mask mandate? Do you, do you foresee any issues there? Well, certainly uh, we're prepared for that. I hope not. I hope race fans understand this was one of the one of the stipulations we had to do to make sure that we could have the race with fans. We're going to have mask ambassadors out. They'll be asking people, reminding people to get their masks on. And I don't want to go here if I don't have to, but we have already talked through the ways that we would enforce that. And if we have to, uh, we're prepared to remove people from the facility. But I'm really hoping that our race fans will, will help us out. Keep those masks on when you're not eating and drinking, and let's just try and have a good race day. One day this year, the Indy 500 help us out, and then in 2022, hopefully we're back to normal. All right. Hey, what about tickets? Are they going to be physical, or are they moving virtual this year? 
you know, we talked about that and so many of our customers don't have a digital capability really. So we are going to be physical tickets. Those will be mailed out sometime probably next week. We'll let customers know when those start coming. So they will be physical this year, but they'll get scanned. So we won't have to take them and rip them like we've had in the past. So a little bit uh, more limited uh, interaction in terms of touching, uh, touching folks. But what we have learned recently is that that isn't really the way COVID's transferred. So we're feeling a little bit better about that. And that, that race ticket, having that in your hand is really an important piece of the experience for an Indy 500 goer. And they love to have that ticket. I think a lot of fans would agree with you on that one. Hey, last question for you. How did you come about these rules, uh, the, the capacity limits? What was the process like to determine that? A lot of ways it started last year when we were starting thinking we were going to have the race in August of last year with fans, just working with the city and with the state. And then really the, over the last six weeks or so, it's been an almost daily uh, conversation with somebody from the Marion County Health Department or folks from the mayor's office to start working together where we could find a landing spot that worked well for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and worked well for the city of Indianapolis in terms of trying to make sure we can put on an event that's uh, that's been very, very comfortable. And then ultimately we settled on where we uh, where we announced last Wednesday, we settled, settled on that on Tuesday last week. So as soon as we knew the protocols, we were quick to let our customers know. All right, Doug Bowles, we'll see you in May. I can't wait. Thanks. Good conversation. I want to bring back in our panel now. The Speedway about about to allow 135,000 people to attend that big race. Dr. Kane, any concerns about this, and and what precautions uh, should those attending actually take? Well, I I think the thing that we have to look at, if you look at the the state of Indiana, I think almost everything is open to 100% capacity for for the rest of the state. And as you know because we are have a higher population density as a county compared to most other uh, counties in the state. We have a little bit different uh, recommendations that we make in terms of restrictions. And so as you see there, um, uh, normally you would see about 350,000 fans out there that we've cut the number of fans dr uh, dramatically, at least less than 50% that you'll see uh, out there and we feel pretty comfortable because this is an outdoor event so that's really critical as opposed to indoors that we saw with the NCAA but also uh, notwithstanding the importance of still wearing masks um, doing the social distancing and the hand washing and the fact that I think uh, IMS is going to uh, really try to encourage um, our spectators and fans um, as well as the city of Indianapolis, please get vaccinated. That is so critical, I think, for the safety of our fans. And the fact that we have already uh, at least a fifth of our way through, uh, going on to a third of our way of our residents being vaccinated, I think that's also a major uh, factor in our decision-making process related to this particular um, event with spectators. Dr. Jones, we mentioned the symphony, which will be playing to a much smaller crowd, but indoors. Uh, in your opinion, should people feel comfortable going to smaller indoor events? I think they should. I think as long as you are adhering to the, to the recommendations and the guidelines, um, you're wearing your mask, you're being considerate of other people who want to attend the event, then I think that as long as you're being careful, washing your hands, uh, wearing your mask properly, which means to cover your nose and your mouth, so not below your chin, not just covering your mouth, nose and mouth should be covered. So I think if you wear your mask properly, you social distance, um, that I think people should be, um, you know, be open to going to indoor events. But I think also to keep in mind that the small subset of people who won't wear their mask properly or don't want to wear the mask, I just want to put the message out there that you guys are the ones holding us back. So <laughs> if you're not going to adhere to the guidelines we're going to constantly have guidelines that are going to be in place because it's going to take us longer to get to where the COVID um, excuse me COVID infection rate has dramatically de um, decreased and hopefully the vaccination rates will go up so be a good be a good Hoosier and wear your mask properly and don't fuss when someone asks you to put it back up Dr. Jones, some people are going to watch this thing and say states like Texas and, and Florida, they dropped their mask mandate a couple weeks back and their numbers are going down. Your, your thoughts on that, your response? Uh, well, first, we're in Marion County. We're not in Texas. Uh, and so you should just adhere to our guidelines. And, every, you know, their infection rate may be going down, and that's great. Um, but I think that, you know, each, 
county, each state, each city is different. Um, and one individual could, you know, we don't all make the rules. We have to follow our local guidelines. And just because something is going on in Texas doesn't mean that the same situation is going to be here in Indianapolis. It doesn't mean that we have the same strains. Um, and it also doesn't mean that we have the same capacity at hospitals and ICUs. We may have a sicker population that are still in hospital beds. And then if your loved one were to get sick and need that bed, you would want that to be available. Dr. Keene, what about uh, colleges and some high schools who will be holding graduations in the coming weeks? Have you uh, been in contact with any superintendents or, or things of that? So a significant number of those of those superintendents and people are, are um, turning in their plans and uh, they appear to be some really good plans where they're maintaining the social distancing um, and of course wearing their masks and being very careful about um, making sure that there's no uh, crowd interaction as they're moving through large number of students for graduation. So they have some really good safe uh, protocol measures that they have put in place. Even to uh, taking pictures with the seniors who are graduating uh, with the superintendents and the principals of their schools. So I think they're doing a, a great job. Summer's coming up. Is it safe to travel? So that's a tougher question, I think, and it depends on the person, and it may depend on where you travel. Uh, I'm very cognizant of when I travel, trying to look at uh, what airports I may be in, what's the likelihood that there's a large number of, of uh, variant strains that are taking place, and what's that percentage, um, what's the infection rate, um, are we seeing a lot of deaths, related to those sites or the cases increasing. So I think those are things that I take into consideration uh, when I travel. So I think it's important for everybody uh, to look at that. Because Kimball, this plays into the mental health issue, right? People have had to cancel or delay vacations the past year and people need to get away at some point, right? Absolutely. And you know, one of the things I'm really looking forward to this year um, is focusing on and educating people about the concept of mental fitness, which is just like physical fitness, and that means intention. And it's not that, oh, well, I'll, I'll take care of my mental health or addiction issues if I need to. No, this is consistent and ongoing mental fitness. So it is so important to get away, whether that's a staycation in some aspect or out. In, in safe places, that's, that's important. But uh, working on mental health and making that an important component of your overall health is a great thing. Mental fitness, I like that. I do too. Mm -hmm. Still ahead, uh, when can we all ditch the masks and start to feel safe again? Our panel weighs in. You're watching Wish TV, Indiana's only statewide TV news network. From Wish TV, this is a News 8 Town Hall, Vaccine Central, presented by Community Health Network. I keep asking me, well, what is it we have to get to to feel safe? For me, it's, it's everyone that is able to take the vaccine to take it, because I don't want any Hoosier to perish from a disease that we have a vaccine that has this good of a result with it. I mean, you know, when we look at influenza, and I know we've said this before, when we hit on a vaccine in a good year, we've got 40 to 60 percent coverage. You know, this vaccine is 94 percent effective at preventing infection and 99 percent effective at preventing hospitalizations and death. So my number is as close to 100% as I can get. I think that we'll know when we start to see the cases go down and stay down. I don't think that we're there yet. We've got to get quite a bit more, but certainly our goal is, is, is well above 60%. And that's State Health Commissioner Dr. Chris Fox talking about when she would feel comfortable enough uh, for people uh, who have been vaccinated to stop wearing masks. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, Dr. Kane, I want to start with you. Same question, 30 seconds. When would you feel comfortable uh, that enough people have been vaccinated? Probably 80 to 90 percent only because of the development of these resistant strains. I had said 70 to 80 percent 80 before, but now I'm at the 80 to 90 percent range. Hmm. Dr. Jones? Uh, I would agree with Dr. Kane. Um, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable with the mask, and I think I would definitely 
feel more comfortable coming out in public, going uh, indoors for events, restaurants, those things of that nature when the infection rate has gone down and our vaccination rate has um, increased. And I just want to give each three of you a, a closing statement. Uh, what message do you want to get out to Hoosiers regarding vaccines uh, and how we're doing as a state? Kimball, we'll start with you. Mental health is important and should be part of your consideration when you're thinking of your overall health. If you have any concerns about the virus, listen to your uh, primary care physician, uh, look at reputable websites like the Centers for Disease Control and these two awesome doctors right up here. <laughs> Dr. Kane, your final, your final thoughts? I just think that it's important for you to be knowledgeable. You know, do the reading, do your own homework and listen to the science, but more important, if you get vaccinated, we'll be closer and closer to returning to our normal activities. So do the right thing. Dr. Jones, you touched on that earlier. Did. And Dr. Kane, she took my final <laughs> time. <laughs> I, so I, I couldn't have, ditto. yeah, I couldn't have said it better. You know, if we all want to get back to normalcy, we all have to do our part, whether we're vaccinated or not. Just because you're vaccinated does not mean you're exempt from the rules and the guidelines. We need to all do our part so we can come together and get back to normalcy as, as soon as possible. Dr. Jones, Dr. Kane, Kimball, thank you for being here tonight. Thank Great you. conversation. All right, we will have much more coming up tonight on the news at 10 and 11. And as always, wishtv.com. But for now, that was our Vaccine Central Town Hall with local experts. Be safe. We'll see you back here tonight. Have a great night.